And really, I think it's about like, if it's a priority, you will do it. So is this a priority to me? And a lot of times the question is, the answer is no. Like when I ask my clients, they're like, oh, I really should wake up earlier. And I'm like, well, is that a priority? Like of all the things, is that a priority? It's like, no, actually it's not. So what is the priority? So I think shifting to really ask yourself, is this a should based off of what society is telling me or based off of what other people are telling me? Or is this what like my heart's really saying I, I need to do and is a priority in my life? Anne Swanson joins me on the podcast to talk about her book, The Science of Yoga. We also go over consistency in self-care, using a neti pot, some yoga breathing techniques, and more. Anne Swanson, welcome to The Self-Care Mission. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks so much for joining me remotely on the podcast. Shall I call you Nick or Nicholas? Nick is perfect. Okay. Nicholas is an old life. Uh, <laughs> well, Nick is an even older life. I don't know. I change, I change how I go by sometimes, but Nick is great. Because when I called you a few moments ago, I got this great song. And I oh, think yeah. you said you were Nicholas on your um This is Nicholas. Voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should probably change that. That's all. No, I love it. Do it. Do, do the little jingle. Let's hear it. This is Nicholas. Leave a message if you must. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of the Seinfeld episode where they're like, I think it was George that had it on his. It was like, uh, believe it or not, George is not home. <laughs> leave a message after the beep. Where could I be? Believe it or not. I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I, uh, well, it was based off of that, yeah. like do the song. I don't know. It's a, like it's you gotta like keep, put a smile. A everyone who hears that likes it, so I've been incentivized to keep it. So yeah, you should keep it. Yeah. Like so we are gonna. I should mention you are the author of Science of Yoga, a book all about the connection, the mind body connection, and the science behind you. We're going to talk about this later. If you're watching the video, I'm currently holding up a copy of it right now. Um, but to start, I, I love to talk because I know you're, you're very grounded in wellness and health and yoga, and you're, you're also a fellow a licensed massage therapist. So, I mean, clearly a big part of this answer is going to be yoga, spoiler alert. But my question is, how do you show up for yourself? What is currently in your self-care tool kit? I, well, I think a big part of it would be yoga. I actually recently have been doing a massive amount of Tai Chi Qigong. Oh. Um, most of my physical practice has been that. Now with yoga, since yoga isn't just the poses, the asana practice, it's also the breathing practices, the meditation, and um, a variety of other practices. Even this morning I did my neti pot, right? That's a yoga technique. So I absolutely do yoga, but my, my physical practice has been a lot more of Tai Chi recently and running in nature, partly so I can get out in nature to a lake, a river, wherever, and practice Tai Chi. So oh, that's great. Less of the, so wait, so just a little sidebar, uh, the neti pot, is that just like a, a health wellness kind of ongoing. Like I always think of using that when I start to get congested to clip, but is this more of like a preventative? Is that something you can do preventatively or? Yeah, absolutely. To breathe better. And I'm actually making by request a YouTube video about how to safely use the neti pot. So I'll send that to you to put in the show notes. And in oh, the great. Below, um, when that's completed. Um, but it's, it'll be on my YouTube channel, which is Anne Swanson Wellness. I'll also give you the link for that. So yeah, it's my doctor recommends because I have allergies that I do it Actually, she says twice a day, two entire pots twice a day, which is more than I do. I will admit, I don't fully follow wow. doctor's orders with that, but I do it at least once a day um, when it's in this season, the change of weather right now. Now, oh, okay. sometimes I don't feel like I need to do it every day and it's more of a like once a week sort of thing. Um, but I think it's pretty cool that it's this ancient practice, this, this practice that yogis did to be able to breathe better when you breathe better, you can meditate better and live better, right? That was the whole purpose of it. And now we can do it for also, also health benefits. You know, my allergist is telling me to do it to help me 
with my allergies, prevent sinus infections, um, to yeah, just breathe better now. Yeah, and is it always just the 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 salt solution that goes in there? Are people ever putting like magical herbs in any? Or I guess it would be kind of dangerous. You'd have to really know. You never put anything other uh, uh, up your nose, right? Like yeah, maybe people are, but I would not suggest it. So my YouTube video is going to be much more thorough, but I'll give you the shortened version on yeah. it. Um, that's, the, that's the stuff that I'm used to seeing. Yeah, the rent. That, yeah. yeah. This is what I'm going to be, um, this is what I, I recommend using. Although you see the traditional neti pot, they also, this brand offers that neti pot. Oh, yeah. Now, my doctor says to use this. I think it's much more comfortable. And if you are uncomfortable with it, because the first few times it's really uncomfortable, this is a much like smoother experience. You're holding, it's sort of a plastic squeeze bottle kind of situation, yeah. Yep, exactly. So it comes with the salts and it's specific salts. You can't just use like salt from your kitchen. It's salt that's prepared for this. I usually only use like a third of a packet because it can kind of sting. That's where my tolerance level is. You can use as much as like your tolerance is. Um, and then you fill it up with distilled water or boiled water. Boiled yeah. for like five minutes. Yeah, I That's made that the- mistake one time. That was not comfortable. Yeah, yeah. So well, you want it to be warm, warmer than a little bit warmer than body temperature by the time you're ready to use it. Um, but you want to make sure that you use really pure water, not just like in the shower, filling it up. That's not yeah. cool. And then you want to make sure you use these salts, not anything else. Um, so yeah, I that's what I do. Um, once a day, I'd say right now is where I am with it. But like uh, the way I can breathe afterwards makes a huge difference. And I, I think that it's one of the things that my allergist gave me, which is funny because I was already like knew about it from yoga, but it was one of the top things my allergist gave me that actually works and helps. Oh. All right. Well, that's a good, I, I, you know, I think I might, well, the wet, the weather is starting to turn, turn here. So maybe this might be a good opportunity to, to do that preventatively. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's absolutely. cool. So I know you've been sort of steeped in the yoga lifestyle, health and wellness for, for a while, but are there, has there ever been a time when you haven't been able to show up consistently for yourself and I mean, you're human. So if, if the answer is no, that I'll be impressed. But <laughs> if, so if, you know I'm lying. if you've ever been there, how did you get back to, to show up more consistently? Well, I think that I'm like always there in one aspect of my life or mm-hmm. another, right? It's just like constant balancing acts. Like I was thinking about it this morning. I've journaled since I could write. So like since yeah. I was seven, I have journals with like smiley faces all the way up to now, like nice, uh, you know, planner type journals that I keep. Um, but I'm like not always consistent on it. I know I feel better when I do it, but I kind of go back and forth with that. Um, say, you know, I think all the aspects, I'm just balancing them and there's only so much time in the day. So you kind of have to pick and choose what is best for you at that time. Um, so right now I am exercising a lot because of the, the isolation we have and like that's one thing that you can do in isolation um, but typically my like my self-care is different so I just feel like it's always kind of changing um, I think the most inconsistent thing for me that's a struggle is the mornings mm. so I feel like when I look at my day all the things I do for self-care they all add up you know I stop and I do tai chi while I'm waiting for the water to boil I go on walks I do my neti pot, I take baths. I actually give myself massages like when I'm putting on oil after my bath, like pretty regularly. Like I do a lot of self care, but I find in the mornings, it's really hard. Mm. I'll I'll watch a TikTok and they're like, make sure that the first 30 minutes of your day, you don't look at your phone. So then the next day I'll be super motivated and I'll set that intention. And, And now I'm back to like this morning, I was on Instagram all all in my bed you know like I think that's been the hardest thing is the consistency of what I do in the morning um and getting my day started off right uh, yeah well it sounds like you have a good relationship with that whereas 
I have a history of sort of beating myself up over not showing up consistently. And then it just sort of spirals from there, you know, like hmm. I, I make a bad choice. So then I just decide I should continue to do that because I'm incapable of making good choices. <laughs> We all do a little bit of that. And really, yeah. I just, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Okay. So I say to myself multiple times a day progress, not perfection. Nice. I like that. Progress. That, could, that might be the title of this episode. Progress, not perfection. <laughs> I got it from one of my business mentors, Marie Forleo. And um, I, I know that name. I can relate to her a lot. And I think that that. It's just something that stuck with me. I'm, I'm writing that down. So, so you you speak about wellness. Yeah, I, not right now, but you normally you go around speaking to groups, and you have uh, private clients. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm mainly a yoga therapist, so I mainly work one on one with people uh, with chronic pain, arthritis, back pain. I do even Tai Chi Chi Gong for right. health, uh, a program that I teach that's really helpful for arthritis and, and balance and fall prevention. And so mainly one-on-one, -on -one, but then I teach groups of people or teach teachers. Yeah. So when you're, especially in the one-on-one, -on -one, how do you convince, if they need convincing, individuals to show up consistently for themselves? Is there anything you communicate to them or, or does someone just have to be ready or is, is there no convincing? I think that I don't try to convince them. Instead, I ask them questions to find out where they are ready. There's somewhere in their life they're ready to change mm -hmm. and they'll tell me. Um, this process called motivational interviewing. So I'm trying to see where they're the most motivated in their life to make the change. And then we're gonna work from there rather than me convincing them or me putting my, um, my goals and my ideas on them. Um, I think that a lot of times people know what is their priority if you ask them and they're willing to, they just need that like final, like how do I do it? You know, yeah. how do I actually get there? And that's where I can help them. But yeah, I think you have to have the motivation and everybody has it for one aspect or another of their life. Yeah. And so people that find you are maybe more primed to the sort of wellness, yoga, Tai Chi lifestyle, or do you ever encounter mm -hmm. people, not, not so much? I'm just, I guess my question is, is when it comes to mindfulness practices, like, mm -hmm. Do you ever have to, how do you, how do you get a skeptic to try that kind of stuff? Someone yeah, who might I, think it's too out there to, yeah, how do you bridge that? Or maybe it helps that it's so much more part of the conversation now than it was even five years ago, but I don't know, maybe any, any thoughts there? Yeah. I mean, I, the people that come to me want to learn it. So I will say that. Um, but I do work with a lot of beginners. And I think that one reason that my work is approachable to beginners is because I focus on like accessible things that you can do, practical things you can do through the day, rather than like, we're all going to come up with a one hour yoga routine you're going to do every morning. It's like, no, when do you have some time? Oh, when you're walking your dog? Okay. And you're in that grassy area. Let's do some tree pose there, a little dynamic balance on that grassy area to help build proprioception. You're already out there. Let's fit it into your life. Oh, when do you have the most pain? Oh, it's right when you're trying to fall asleep and you can't get to sleep. Let's do this bed yoga practice that you can do right in bed for five minutes. Here's an audio to follow. And then um, it'll help you fall asleep better. So that's one way is focusing on making it accessible and practical. Um, but I, I think a big part of my approach as a science educator, as well as a yoga therapist and Tai Chi for Health instructor, massage therapist, a big part of my approach is looking at the research to support it and um, specifically focusing on the benefits and safety. So I think that when I can say why we're doing it and why I want them to learn this, it makes a big difference in motivating them. When I can tell them physiologically what they're transforming by doing this simple act, whether it's transforming in their brain through mindfulness, like you just mentioned, I can explain 
what is changing, what research has shown as far as changing your brain chemistry, your brain structure, um, and that sort of information can be really motivating for a lot of people. It's like, oh, I'm actually literally changing my brain. Uh, so I think that approach also motivates people, at least the people that are attracted to me in my work. Yeah, that's cool. So as I've started to talk to more people about, well, I've as a massage therapist, I, I'm often talking to people about the ways in which they take care of themselves, whether it's if they're showing up for stretching and foam rolling and that kind of thing. And I hear this mo most of the time. And I also say it myself. I know I should do that and I should do this. And I feel so much better when I do this thing. So I was interested because I saw an article that you had written about mm -hmm. the should mindset. So mm -hmm. I, I just wondered if you could share some of the, the thoughts around getting that sort of like should mindset reframed or. Yeah. Not, yeah. One of my mentors would tell me, Anne, you're shitting all over yourself. <laughs> so for me, um, I do a lot of shoulds as a recovering perfectionist to catch myself in those shoulds quite a bit. Um, and really, I think it's about like, if it's a priority, you will do it. So is this a priority to me? And a lot of times the question is, the answer is no. Like when I ask my clients, they're like, oh, I really should wake up earlier and I'm like well is that a priority like of all the things is that a priority it's like no actually it's not so what is the priority so I think shifting to really ask yourself is this a should based off of what society is telling me or based off of what other people are telling me or is this what like my heart's really saying I, I need to do and is a priority in my life yeah what if it's a should that you like I should not eat I should eat well because I already know it makes me feel better like mm -hmm. like I I've proven example or I should sleep the seven to eight hours that I already know serves me well in basically every way and yet priorities right but I still don't always do those things <laughs> <laughs> and progress, not perfection. I mean, you're not going to always hit it every night, but um, I think catching myself when I say should and like ask myself, is this a priority? And then like setting an intention if it is, okay, well, I will tonight do this. Even if it's just that one step, right? Um, doing it just this one day, the, right? We live in the moment. So can we do it right now? Yeah, Not, I should do it every day. Oh no, of these seven days, I only did it two. Like, no, I'm going to try to do it tonight. I will prioritize this. Uh, but you're not going to hit it all the time. I mean, I said that I shouldn't be looking at my phone in the morning in bed. And this morning I did that. And that's, <laughs> that's progress, not perfection. I do it yeah. less than I used to. And then, but then that doesn't, that doesn't derail the rest of your life. You're just like, that happened. and that's fine and I can try to do it differently in the future and not you can just focus on right now. Yeah, and I think for with that example, right, is like really the purpose is I'm trying not to be controlled by technology and use technology wisely as a tool. So like, am I setting that overall intention through the day? So even though I checked this morning, okay, I did my Instagramming this for the day this morning. Maybe I can catch myself when I try to click it the seven other times this afternoon. So yeah, I guess that's kind of where I am with it today. Um, the, rather than beating myself up about it. Yeah, that's smart. So, so speaking of social media, we originally became aware of each other through TikTok. Yep. What a wonderful, weird place that is. Um, it is. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your, your experience there and, and why you like it and what you garner from that community. Well, I studied video in school. Okay. I did um, documentary film. So I was behind the camera and as well as photography. Often I was behind the camera. Of course, we'd model for each other for things, but like often I was the one behind the camera and I in editing and editing videos. And so I think that that's an area that I knew would always come back in some way. And I have a YouTube channel and like, I love doing YouTube videos, but those are like 
time consuming to make YouTube yeah. videos. So when I saw TikTok being like these short little like highly edited videos that you can do at your fingertip, I was very intrigued. And um, just getting to know the platform, how to edit like right on your phone, it's it's just like this amazing tool. I can't even imagine what it would be like to have had that when I was in art school. Um, I, I love the tool itself. And I guess Instagram Reels is trying to become that now. <laughs> yeah. um, so we'll have it in a variety of pl platforms, I'm sure, because video is so much more effective. I, um, and I feel comfortable that I can speak in video. And from, I guess, my experience behind the camera as well as in front of the camera, um, I'm not always super comfortable, but overall, I feel like I'm getting better and better at video. So it was this also great opportunity to practice doing short videos, especially the ones where you just talk to the screen. You yeah. do a lot of videos. I was doing a lot of the like pointing at words and, and yeah. definitely yoga poses. But then uh, like practicing my speaking skills by just like talking to the screen. So I really yeah. enjoyed it for a while. I was doing one every day. I started, I started in June, 2020. Okay. Um, and I did one every day for four months. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed it. Um, and, but I, I definitely slowed down recently. And yeah, kind of reassessing what to do with it. Yeah, it's hard to keep up that kind of pace, but I, I think I'm going to give it another shot. I, I really, it's fun to just be engaged with that, and I, I actually just feel like it's it's helping people. Whether I'm, sh you know, like showing uh, the foam rolling or a stretch, or it's reaching someone who you always get like a comment or two, like I need this is exactly what I needed in this moment. So that's just always kind of like motivates me to keep going with it yeah yeah and my I was just gonna say my most popular videos I just kind of did them real quick I was like you know I'm about to run a digestive workshop and this is what a lot of my clients need like my videos I'm like what do my clients need that I could actually send them in the future right like what do people constantly ask me and it was for constipation how to sit on the toilet uh, and, oh, I've and seen I, that one. yeah yeah and like I did not expect that would be like my claim to fame. I mean, like showing different ways to sit on the toilet, but I feel like it's really practical um, to, and it can really transform somebody's day, somebody's life. My, yeah. my guru in India, my teacher in India, he told me when I was showing him and asking him some questions on how I could teach on... Um, the helping people with constipation he said he said this this what you're doing here this is good karma helping get the shit out of people is really good <laughs> karma <laughs> and i didn't feel that way i like i'm slightly embarrassed because i'm like this is like so cheesy i'm like showing how you sit on the toilet and showing how you can give yourself an abdominal massage um, to help with constipation like i'm just putting yeah. it all out there but like yeah it's that's real people. life that's practical stuff yeah yeah that's awesome so yeah i if you're listening to this i would encourage you to look for Anne on tiktok as well so that you can also learn how to use the toilet yeah. <laughs> at Anne swanson wellness and but also a lot a lot about yoga and breathing and mindfulness and health and wellness overall i think i i like tiktok like not only by and large the comments from people are very positive and supportive i've mm -hmm. had my share of like not so good ones too, but I guess that's just comes with the territory. But you can kind of like curate your life and like follow people like you and like healthy cooking channels and like just like fill up your feed with like other self care thoughts. It's like a nice, it can be a nice boost if you don't choose to follow like negativity and. I don't know. Yeah, and the way the algorithm works is it's showing you, it's getting to know you and showing you what you really will like. And so that's kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also can be like, oh my God, how did it know that I would like this? Um, it's funny for my 
sitting on the toilet one, I got a lot of people commenting, how did TikTok know I was on the toilet right now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think that like the people that I've engaged with, I see more and more similar content and it has been like, like very inspiring to see, see what I get. Yeah, that's cool. So, okay. Um, I want to make sure I got to this. I know I'm bouncing around a lot. Sorry, I'm a little haphazard, but you, your work in yoga therapy, what should people know about how that differs from just like yoga practice or dropping into a yoga class? What is, what does this look like? Yeah. So I am a certified yoga therapist through the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And this means that in addition to doing my like basic teacher training, which is 200 hours, I actually have 800 hours on top of that in a two year degree program with clinical practice. So, I mean, I actually have more because I did my 500 hour in India and all these other trainings, but like that's the minimum to be a yoga therapist is a thousand hours specifically on working with clinical populations, on your scope of practice, on biomedicine, as well as a philosophy. There's a lot of yoga philosophy in that training to maintain the rich tradition. And so I'm trained to work with people with specific health conditions in a safe way um, as an adjunct therapy to whatever they're doing with their healthcare providers. So often I'm working with a team that my client also has a nutritionist and a therapist and a health coach, and we're all working together and communicating. There's a variety of ways to do that though. Um, sometimes they take private clients where it's like a, a yoga teacher or a yoga, a yogi, an avid yogi themselves that um, wants a more sustainable practice, right? And like they need that more in depth anatomy and physiology knowledge. Um, but I'm, also, I'm often working with beginners, people with chronic diseases, five or more chronic diseases. Most of my clients have um, chronic pain, like from arthritis, back pain, um, high blood pressure, um, often living in larger bodies, um, as well as diabetes is a really common concern that I see. Um, so yeah, multiple health conditions is really what it prepares me to work with. That's great. And then is it, was it your work that led you to write the science of yoga? Tell yeah. me about the, uh, the, uh, the initial idea to, to pursue this project. Well, I was pursued. You were pursued. I love that. Tell me about that. So um, I focus on science and research to support the practice. I teach an evidence-based program called Yoga for Arthritis. I write articles about the research that supports yoga. And so I had a bunch of articles up online um, from, from that perspective, as well as my YouTube videos that speak from that perspective. And um, an editor read them and liked the way I spoke, as well as for writing a book, they were looking for somebody with, I, I believe, based off of their other authors, um, somebody with a master's degree in the field. And I have a master's of science in yoga therapy. And so, um, it, as well as being a professor, an adjunct professor in, in fields like anatomy. Um, so yeah, it just kind of came my way when I was open to it. And it was very intense uh, time writing it, but amazing to work with a team of phenomenal editors as well as the illustrator and designer. So amazing. Um, Aaron, Lewis, and, and Claire, uh, they are just phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, it's filled with like, you get to see uh, all the different yoga poses and then very like detailed descriptions of not just like what it's doing, like the what and the why of the pose. Like, I think mm -hmm. a lot of us who like, I, I don't have a yoga practice, but I've dropped into yoga before and I've done it here and there. And I, I never knew like what it was supposed, but like this can really show you like what's happening when you're in downward dog or child's pose. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what, oh wait, I had a, I had a specific question about this. 
So like yeah, the, the yoga science connection, what can you tell us about? I know you, you're, you're steeped in science from your, your NASA scientist. Was it your, your mom or your dad? My dad yeah. is a NASA scientist. Um, How cool is that? Yeah. And if you ever come to any of y'all ever come to my any of my live classes, my dad comes to almost all of my live classes, like when I teach via Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> so you to meet him. Um, I have lots of live classes on my website that um I'm constantly adding. So yeah, I um I think the biggest thing about the science to support yoga is that it is supporting yoga for all the systems of the body for the whole person for major chronic diseases. So I think a lot of people think, oh, the science of yoga, it might be this pose helps with this thing. No, that's not what it is. It's yoga as a practice. Yoga is the poses, the breathing techniques, the meditation, the relaxation, the whole practice is helpful with people with arthritis for 40% pain relief compared mm. to the control. Like that is significant. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at how yoga helps um, prevent or even uh, as, a, as a part of a lifestyle can reverse heart disease, can lower your blood pressure, can help with cancer treatments. This is, it's for these populations that um, are dealing with lifestyle diseases and chronic pain that yoga the research is showing yoga is really impactful, which is huge because that's where our medical system needs more adjunct therapies, needs more things like yoga, massage, more um, more empowering tools that people can take on their own. So I think that's the biggest thing I would like to say about the science of yoga is that it affects yoga affects all the systems of the body, especially because it affects your nervous system, which is your master control system, trickles down, improves your digestion, improves, improves your immunity. We can see that it's improving your immunity by looking at inflammatory markers and how it's reduced in your blood after practicing yoga and doing meditation. So yoga affects all the systems, your whole person. It's not just about like this pose helps with this thing. It's the whole practice. That's amazing. Yeah. So I, I think I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I have this now. I can use it as a reference to, cause I, I often like suggest poses, you know, I'm not, I'm not a yoga practitioner. I've never been trained, but I know the names of some of these things just because they kind of come up in the massage therapy context. So, uh, you know, like, like the pigeon pose, I really like trying to get people to spend time in that pose just because it it's helped me like, in my life and I, I feel like opening up people's hips and everything and so many people have low back troubles and but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you if you could wave a magic wand and and convince the average person to even if they're not going to invest time in a yoga practice but like maybe like a, a pose or two or three that just like could like level up their life a little bit or take okay. care of very common issues I got it, but it's not a pose. Oh, I think that the top thing that you could do if you want maximum benefit of yoga is to change the way you breathe. Okay, tell me. So first of all, the, as they say in India, the nose is for breathing, the mouth is for eating. So noticing when your mouth breathing and trying to shut your mouth relax your jaw and breathe in and out of the nose. That's where, as I mentioned earlier, having the neti pot, if you're, if you're stuffed up, can really help so that you can better nose breathe. Of course, there's circumstances where we can't do that. Like if you are sick, you may have to breathe through your mouth during that time, but as much as possible, breathe through the nose. Now, we can do several different breaths and the changing of the lengths of the breaths is something that the yogis intuited 
changes your mood, changes how you feel. They often described it as like a sun energy, very energizing, or a moon energy, very like calming and cooling. But now we look at these breathing techniques and we can see that, for example, when you elongate your exhales, when you make them longer than the inhales, the yogis called that that moon breath. They called it that more relaxing breath. What's actually happening is you're stimulating your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve is the only cranial nerve to leave your brainstem area and go to your heart and your lungs. When that vibration of the elongated exhale stimulates, activates the vagus nerve, it tells your heart to slow down, your blood pressure to go down, your digestion to actually improve, to, to like um, focus on these inner workings being at their optimal level. So the top trick I can give is to try to breathe in and out through the nose, slowly elongating your exhales and allowing your abdomen to move with you. So what we'll do is we'll put, just put your hands on your belly. I actually like to put them more on my um, upper belly, like near where my low ribs are. This is where your diaphragm is, just so that I can feel there um, the movement. And I want you to just start by breathing in and out through the nose regular and feel that movement in that area. Allow that movement. Sometimes when we're stressed, we breathe up in our chest, but allow the movement of the diaphragm, bringing the breath down. It's not about how deep you breathe. It's actually better to do a slow breath. So try to slow your breath down, especially now start to try to slow and elongate that exhale. Just to whatever your body naturally lets you do for now. We'll count it in a moment but slow the breath and allow that movement. When you're breath, breathing through your nose, it does naturally slow the breath. That neti pot I talked about earlier is bringing water, salt water into these sinuses around your face, these holes in your skull, which basically you have holes in your skull about the size of a billiard ball. So that's quite a lot of space in there. And when the air goes in your nose, it filters through those holes and it slows the air down. By the time it gets to your lungs, it's slower. But also we're consciously slowing it right now. When the air moves into the lungs slower, the lung cells, the alveoli can take more oxygen from them. So being more efficient with less. Let's bring a count to the breath now. So let's start with a two second inhale and about a four second exhale. Then we're gonna move up to three and six. Okay. Maybe you can do four and eight. We'll just do a couple of those. So inhale, two, exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, exhale. Let's do three and six, or you can stay at that rate if that's better for you. Inhale, two, three, exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, exhale. Inhale. Exhale. This is the right pace for you. You can stay with this or maybe try the four and eight. You don't want it to be forced. So whatever rate's good for you. So inhale, two, three, four. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. And continue on whichever of those worked best for you for just a few rounds. Maybe close your eyes. 
And feel and allow the abdomen to move, keeping the breath low and slow. Elongating those exhales. One more breath like this. When you're done, just gently open your eyes. Notice how you feel from all those components. So nose breathing, from low and slow breath, allowing your abdomen to move with you, as well as from elongating those exhales. That is a trick you can do anywhere, at a red light, in line at the grocery store, trying to sleep at night, anytime you need to calm down your nervous system. That's great. What a great impromptu <laughs> breath exercise. That's we what I thought. <laughs> we didn't even plan that. My face is tingling now. I don't know if that's normal. <laughs> well, I would say um, I don't want anybody to do it in a forced way. That's why I give the options. So if it, you may be able to build up to the four and eight, for example, I mean, I know a lot of musicians and singers can go like that easily, but anytime you feel like for those of you practicing at home, it's a little forced, just take it down a notch and do two and four. It doesn't have to be perfect. It could also be three and five. It doesn't have to be exactly double, but find the rate that's working for you and stick with that. I'll say even for me through the day, it changes. Sometimes at night, I feel like I can't go quite as long. Maybe it's the I'm laying there. Um, and then sometimes during the day when I'm sitting up taller, I can take those longer breaths. So you'll notice differences from day to day or the time of the day of what you can do comfortably. And then do you ever talk through more specific techniques like inhale and then hold and then exhale or maybe the one nostril in and out the others? I'm really big on the nostril breathing and alternating. As far as the holds go, um, basically that's the next step. So we start with elongating your exhales. This is how my teacher in India taught me. That's where anybody can do that one is just focusing on elongating your exhales. For more energy, you can elongate your inhales, just a different, right? That's the more sun breath. That's the focusing on the inhale. Longer inhale, shorter exhale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like reverse so those counts. Exactly. Well, it doesn't have to be exact, but you are um, doing a longer inhale. Um, that's for more energy. Now, when you add in the pausing, or they call it kumbhaka, it's this like um, holding of the breath. It's a little bit more of a advanced practice meaning there's a lot of people that shouldn't do it, right? If you have unregulated high blood pressure or um, you're pregnant, um, heart disease, um, if you get dizzy or faint, there's a lot of people that this wouldn't be appropriate for. Also anxiety, the holding of the breath can be very anxiety producing. Mm -hmm. And for people that have anxiety, it's not recommended. So for that reason, I don't teach it a lot. I more teach those things more one-on-one. -on -one. But the next advancement, if we want to say, of the practice is to um, hold the breath on the exhale and then the inhale. Um, now, I say advancement because it's not like you go to that and you reach some higher level of being, right? It's not, you know, like you could be a very advanced yogi and just be focusing on the most simple of practices. It's more about your mindset and your inner peace that you achieve from it, that connection you have. So I don't really think of it as a more advanced practice, but I would say um, what my teacher in India says is he says a lot of those practices that are like fancier are more for if you live what they call in yoga a sattvic lifestyle. And that's like a monastic lifestyle. Oh. Like if you're living a monastic lifestyle, yeah, you can do all these fancy advanced breath techniques, but are any of us? No, probably most of us just seem to elongate our exhales, be aware of our breath, focus on breathing in and out of the nose, which is one of the biggest things you can do for your health, um, your breathing think, health. Uh, I don't think you get to have TikTok in a monastic lifestyle. No, no. I haven't seen any monks on there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
that would be kind of cool. Anyway, <laughs> Ann Swanson, this has been so great speaking with you. Uh, I really, I'm so glad you did that that little that breath work at the end there. That's that's so helpful. Yeah, that's, my that's pleasure. Awesome. So, um, people can find uh, Science of Yoga where where books are sold. Yes, and you can also read about it and get the links to it, and it's in over 15 languages at. So you get all the links and, and, and a special resource that I made, it's an ebook that goes with the book that outlines and links all the research I talk about there, plus more and summaries of it. Wow. So that's at www.scienceof.yoga where you can find that information. And then your website is Ann Swanson Wellness. Yes, dot, dot com. Yep. And Swanson. then people can find you on the Instagram and of course the TikTok. Yes, and absolutely. We'll We'll link to all those things. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for joining me on the self-care mission. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So nice to meet you. This episode is still presented as part of the self-care mission, but I've actually recently decided to fold everything back into my massage hodgepodge moniker. So there'll be more on that in the future, but for now you can find it in both places and there'll be updates soon. Thanks for listening, and remember to drink lots of water, drop your shoulders, and continue to try to take the best care of your own self. Thanks.